so. And from bottleneck point uh, five, we see that variable costs has a strategic dimension, avoidable cost has a strategic dimension. That means that when there are players, these costs will be a part what they play over. And these are the kind of cost that they will not pay with no production. Kind of cost you will not pay with no production. While the share of the fixed cost that will be sunk is what you pay even though you have no production. Okay? So that's for you to understand when we start playing. Let's then look into table 2-2. Two two. Mm. This is a nice table that summarizes very, very nicely how the different costs could be put together for a company as an example. They produce output units per month from 0 to 12. Then you have total fixed costs, dollar per month, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. You have total variable costs starting with 0 when you have 0 production, going up to 30 when you produce 1, 49. 65, 80, that is from a company, a real life company, and this is the total environmental costs for that company, depending on how much they produce. And total costs is to add column 2 and 3, you will have column 4, starting with 50, that will be when you produce zero. And ending up in 410, if you produce 12. Then, to that very important margin cost concept. What is meant with margin cost? That is, the extra cost you have when you go from 1 to 10 to 2, how much is the extra cost when you increase from 1 to 2? 19, 49 minus 30, 19. If you go from 7 to 8, what is the marginal cost? Yeah? 30. 30. So you see that the margin cost is dollar per unit when you produce an extra unit going from 0 all the way down to 12. And then finally, we have the three column that will be you can read from the top, that is average, average, average. And very often it's okay to have the average. That's just to add and to take the number of units, outputs, output, and you have the average. Average fixed cost, that will decrease. Average variable cost, that will uh, be U-shaped. Average total cost, that is also down and up, down and up. So here, there is an example from real life, how the cost structure will change for a case company in the short run. 
then we just take this table we put it into a figure with exactly the same um, numbers and we end up with that important tool figure 2 1 next picture look at that nice figure mm -hmm. that is from microeconomics still it's just as important in our course and if we take the same figures that we have in the table we worry quantity we have costs and then short run marginal costs we start downwards that is the black one we reach the bottom and then we increase going through point A, B until we have short run margin cost as you know from microeconomics just as a theoretical concept we stick to the table and the practical case the empirical case and in this course with actual numbers and these figures came will come out of numbers and the short run marginal cost call is then down and increase average fixed cost is simple starts with 50 and move downwards average fixed cost and then we have average variable costs that is to take the variable costs and you divide the variable costs with the total quantity and you end up with that red u-shaped figure and why come we end up in point A being minimum average variable cost. Why come? That is because when we start at the left hand side, both short run marginal cost and average variable cost, the black and the red one, they will decrease and then the short run marginal costs starts increasing until it reaches exactly the point A that is the lowest average variable cost you can have because when you put an extra unit when you are in the point A if you put an extra unit going from Q1 till Q1 plus 1, the short run margin cost will be higher than the average variable cost and it increases. So this is the lowest point possible where the short run margin cost intersects with the average variable cost curve and that you will see if you add to the average variable cost if you add to that the fixed cost you end up with a short run average cost that is the total average cost that is the black one S -R -S -R -A -C, short run average cost that is u-shaped ending up in the point B why is the point B an interesting point quantity Q, Q2 what is the cost structure when you produce Q2 units 
and you end up in point B. That is the quantity you produce with the lowest short run average cost that you can achieve for this company. That includes also to cover the fixed cost. Why is A an interesting point? Because when you end up in Q1, you end up with exactly that production where you cover the average variable costs and nothing of the fixed cost. Nothing of the fixed cost. And here for the first time we have, if you are a price taker, you produce salmon. The price as is given from the world market. You sell salmon with quantity Q1. You end up in point A. Will the board of directors be happy with that manager? Not very much. Why? Because you exactly cover your average variable costs. None of the fixed costs. The 50 we don't cover. And the head of the board would say that, OK, just for once, don't go any lower than Q1. And why come? If you go lower, reduce, you end up with variable cost being even lower than the price. So you lose money. So the board of directors will say that since fixed cost here is some cost, we go on. Because none of them are recoverable. We go on Q1. But the director will say that you as a manager, let me see when I meet you next time that we move along the line A to B. What happens when we reach B? The board will say, hooray! Why? We exactly cover the fixed cost. Right. And the board will be happy because that is a loan and they need to pay back to the bank. And they will say, OK, no, we do it. Good. So you will go on producing in between A and B. But you don't have a net profit. You just cover the average cost and part of the fixed cost until you reach B. Why come you move along the short run marginal cost curve? Do you remember that? If you are a price taker and the price will be the line Q1A. That is the price. You exactly cover the variable cost. And since you are a price taker, and since it's competi a competitive market, you end up always to produce where the marginal revenue is equal to the modern cost. What is the modern revenue here? Since the modern revenue will be equal to the price when you are a price taker, 
you always move along when you maximize profit where price equal to marginal cost telling us that every producer every manager will move from A to B all the way up to short run marginal top cost at the top because as a price taker that's what they are forced to do producing Q1 and Q2 depending on what the price will be so once you know the fixed price in the market you know exactly how much to produce because you move along the short run marginal cost curve and these average cost curves they just tell us the minimum production Q1 that you ever will decide to produce and how much to produce Q2 to exactly cover all your expenses that is the simple microeconomic repetition and no, now our <coughs> approach shall be more empirical more case based from actual numbers instead of what you remember from microeconomics you had a production function you had a cost function and these functions gave you these figures we started with a table from a company ending up in these figures as just depicting exactly what comes out of that table if you go back the, the previous picture that one? that one? Yeah. Uh, okay just keep that one it's just to take this picture putting these actual figures this table putting the actual figures into actual numbers into that figure and this table just summarize the cost concepts that you need to be familiar with okay you move to the previous again no previous oh, okay. so this was table 2 2 this was figure two one and then we come to long run costs and economies of scale that would be figure two two mm -hmm. and now one more important distinction one more and one more even one more here we are so far we have dealt with the so called short run perspective there is an important distinction for a company on the way you move strategically in the marketplace when you play as a short run player and when you play as a player where you have a long run perspective because in the long run you definitely know that there will be no such thing as fixed cost why come because in the long run all the assets all the buildings all the roads all the the infrastructure the gas pipeline system seems to be in the short run fixed cost 
but in the long run everything can change so you have a short run and a long run perspective and in the long run you have to consider the investment strategy in the short run you maximize profit just assuming that the fixed cost buildings machinery are taken as a given fixed some of it is recoverable some is not that is important but in the long run everything can change and that makes things easier because now you have another figure instead of short run marginal cost you have long run marginal cost long run marginal cost why is that concept so important for Norway every day when I look into the newspaper I try to look for the long run marginal cost for new oil fields because all economists now will focus the unconventional oil coming from US that is the new technology cracking cracking where the um, researchers came up with a new technique where they could drill and end up exploring new oil fields that has given a new perspective on long run marginal cost why is that important because long run marginal costs from these oil fields will decide the oil prices. Is that important for no one? So when we come to that lecture, when I teach over the complex oil market, I will remind you of the non non marginal cost curve and empirically that is a curve the red one that is exactly the marginal cost to develop new oil fields in US and you start with the cheapest the most cost efficient oil fields you explore them first and then you just rank all the new discoveries of oil fields and you end up with a figure like this a long run modern cost and if that is real world I would say hooray why come? Because since China still is buying more and more and more and more petroleum, as their economy grows, they have a very energy intensive growth. And since petroleum is so important, especially in the transport sector, and we have no substitutes coming up soon they will have a demand for oil and then in the long run 
when the demand will increase and we follow the long run marginal cost curve and if that curve is just moving upwards what will be the price level of oil in the long run this is the case I will move upwards what about R&D how can R&D be a part of this figure what happens if they did not sack the researchers in the US, instead they doubled, and they will come up with a brand new technology that will be so efficient that the long run marginal cost curve shifts downwards. And that shift downwards. And if that shift will go faster, then the demand will grow, the prices will fall. So now, from the analysts following the complex oil market in periods, the analyst said that OPEC is important. They don't say that anymore. And just a few years ago, they said that the demand was important. They don't say that anymore. Either. They just say that this long run margin Costco is the important issue. So, it's a matter of the cost structure. That makes this market very simple, <laughs> but it's not. But the way to try to analyze the market is to try just to sort out the most important part of the market and to that process come up with a model that is simpler and simpler and the simpler it is the easier you might capture what really can be reality in the long run but you must always be aware of when you think that things are too easy, it's not. <laughs> it's always surprise, surprise, surprise. And then the oil market as the complex one. New technology is important. OPEC might be important. Again. International conflict might be important again. Demand might be important again. And the climate decision. In Paris, in 2015, if they agree that this is a catastrophe, we have to take actions and really do much more than we do today that's what you will have to understand because that might change this figure <coughs> but we definitely know that one and maybe the most important part of the complex oil market is this simple no one more Costco In the fish 
farming industry. How does this figure look like in the fish farm industry? In the long run, in the long run, in Norway, that's a very, very regulated market. So all the players out there that want to produce salmon in Norway will have to be friends uh, with the bureaucracy because that is political decisions that will decide how much to produce. They can change over time and say that we just sell the salmon now and then you have less salmon in the next month so you have cycles that makes that market too complicated but in the long run the capacity and the production level will be more or less given by the regulators. So that is not a perfect competitive market system. In Norway. That's just like farming, very regulated. And the regulation of the uh, farming industry in the textbook, <laughs> I every time laugh when they say in the textbook that farming, producing food, is very close to a competitive market in US. In Norway, the regulation system is so complex, I have tried to understand it for 45 years. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> because of complexity in the regulations. And therefore, the final results within the price production structure within the farming industry in Norway is a result that is driven by regulation and regulations and regulations and regulations and a little bit market <laughs> and then regulations again. <laughs> and in the textbook, the example of what's close to perfect competition, farming, not here. <laughs> Not here. That is very protected and heavily subsidized. And we just pay. And that is political, politically acceptable. Through the elections, we elect these parties that subsidize the farming industry heavily. So for eco economists, we just say that through elections, we decide that we agree that this sector should be heavily subsidized. And um, internationally, this is a topic that always will come up. Why do you protect your farmers? You are so dependent on the world market why couldn't you let all the producers out there in the world sell to the Norwegian market? We just protect our market. We don't give them a chance to compete in our market because that is protected. And this is the main reason why we are not a member of EU. <laughs> because we just have decided several times that we want to keep this protection. Should we see if there will be one more picture? Yes. 
we had one more. And I just uh, comment briefly on that one. You can read that in the text, and it's easy to understand that sources of economies of scale can be connected to the production level, the plant level. An example with the plant level is producing aluminium. If you have a plant and you invest, you have to consider economies of scale because the average cost, the long run average cost will fall. And the big plants seems to be most cost efficient and therefore you invest in big plants where electricity prices will be low. But these plants in Norway so I'm. What is meant by this economy of scale? That's just to conclude that if you expand, you can reach some boundaries, some barriers, ending up with extra costs that makes you less cost efficient as in the hospital sector in Norway, all the analysis find no economies of scale. Small hospitals are just as cost efficient as the big one. That is a topic that interests me heavily because it's a hot topic in this region small and big hospitals, have you any economies of scale? And in some sectors, you might even end up that it might be so big, so complex, so bureaucratic, so many decision levels, that a very big hospital can run the risk of this economy is of scale. Being too big, too bureaucratic, too complex. And now and then, economists are allowed to say, as I said when I was young, small is beautiful. Not always, but no and then, small efficient, innovative companies in any sector can give a very efficient economy. Just to conclude that part, our economy consists of only small companies. There is only one big startup. The rest of our companies will, as a small country, in a big world, be small companies. And they compete worldwide. Still they survive. Why come? Because it's not always most efficient to be the biggest. Small can be beautiful. Now I hope it's the last one. <laughs> Next slide. It was. Huh? I guessed it. Then 
it's for me to say that uh, we have just started um, this is basics we have we have just gone through a new chapter and next time I will teach over the next chapter that has the headline competition and monopoly and we'll just follow the textbook so just be patient we just follow step by step and I tell you over and over and over again don't go into depth in the antitrust law in the US read it if you like it but I don't read it if when I prepare lecturing for you <laughs> so I'll meet you next Friday same place and have a good weekend